Well, I believe we've got some folks that are in a celebratory frame of mind this morning. Best I could tell. And we're told in the scriptures to weep for those that weep and rejoice for those that rejoice. So when there's times of rejoicing and times of getting together and celebration, we're glad of that. And just let me take this means to say we're glad to have all of you that are visiting with us today. And I'm sure most, many of those that are visiting are here to help celebrate Natalie's graduation. Let's see here. I'll tell you but what we're going to do. Thank you for Stan, to Stan, for um, filling in last week when I was in the meeting at Argo. And Stan, I understand you covered chapter 8, and then you covered chapter 19, the first half of it. And so Stan said that what we are to do, and this is in the, we're studying in Psalms. And so, um, what, what we're doing this time, this go around in studying the Psalms, is that we're studying them by classification. Many years ago, a long time ago now, we went through the Psalms as we were cycling through the Old Testament, and we started in Psalm 1 and went through Psalm 150. And that was a great study, I thought. I mean, I learned a lot. Even Raymond, even Raymond learned a lot. So it was a good study. But this time around, for several reasons, we're doing it by classification. And um, on Sunday nights, I'm preaching, selecting some of the Psalms um, from our Bible reading schedule. So uh, there are two books in the Old Testament that are, that are quoted more than any of the other books. One is the prophet Isaiah, and the other is the Psalms. So uh, a lot of good reasons for that. Um, to be uh, a, a source of study. So we're, we're going by classification, and um, in just a moment we'll uh, continue and um, pass out questions for any that would need it. We have those available. Cheryl, we have those available. This will be, say, page three at the top. And I've got some up here too. But first, let's bow for a word of prayer. ones that I'm going to use, how we're going to do that. Yes, that's one of, uh, that's one of my, uh, by the way, did everybody get, if, if, you're, if you're getting email, you should have received this chart. Actually, Sue is the one that wrote and asked for that, and I thought, well, probably everybody would like to have a copy of that, so I just did that. That's our timeline, and again, we, we showed that in the 150 Psalms, there are actually five books of collections. But to answer Daryl's question, here is, here is uh, oops, sorry, went too far. There we go. Uh, to answer Daryl's question, this is, uh, this is the way that we're going to uh, approach this. And so we're, we're right now looking at uh, Thanksgiving Psalms. And uh, Daryl, it would probably be good for me to make this available. Is that where you were going with that? I, I, could, I, I thought I could tell the direction you were going. So we'll, we'll do this. Now let me give you one um, uh, thought to keep in mind. That is, when I, when I send you this, and I can make a paper copy for distribution, have that ready too. But 
for, for our purpose here, I've given just, you know, two or three or four at the most, looks like. But as we, as we study these, we're going to do more per category. So you take this chart, you have some already here, because I'm not trying to list everyone in that category, uh, and, and not everyone that we're going to cover is listed here. But those are just some examples uh, of, of the different psalms. So currently we're studying psalms of thanksgiving and psalms of adoration. And so um, the, these are the classifications. But anyway, let me, let me go ahead while I'm thinking about it here. This first sheet has questions on 8, 19, and 29. And um, Stan, could I get you to help on this side? And uh, yeah, Steve will take care of that side. Hold your hand up if you don't have a copy of this. We have plenty of extras. Just raise your hand and we'll make, uh, we'll make fast work of that because we've got a lot to cover this morning. And as I say, uh, we're open, please, to Psalm 19. And we will be looking at that. Yes, you can. Oh, let me see. Yeah, I forget it. It's M I or M A to start with. S H A L. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's the word for that's the word for proverbs. Uh, a common word for uh, for for uh, psalms, by the way, is uh, mitzmor. Uh, M I Z M O R. Um, psalm twenty-three, mitzmor la David, a psalm of David. Uh, you'll also see the word miktam from time to time, but especially the common word that's translated by the Greek word solo is um, the word meets more, if, if you're interested in that. But like you say, you, you can look that up, but I'm, uh, I don't always, the, the, the exact spelling of that, uh, I'd, I'd have to confirm that. That's not, a, that's not a word I spell every day. Brian, did you bring everyone from Garden City here with you? I mean, who is left? I'm looking around, seeing all my Garden City friends. Did you leave anyone there to hold the fort down? Okay. Wow. Steve, it kind of reminds me, I forget which one of the trips, it may have been 2012, to Italy. And um, we had a good number. I forget just how many, but it was a good number, 30-something folks. And so people are saying Leon has brought uh, the, the, these Christians from America. And so wonderful uh, time and worshiping with brethren. One of, the, one of the brothers took David aside and uh, they expressed to him their concern. They, they thought I'd taken the whole church from back home to be with them. I mean, so, of course, that, that swelled the little group at uh, Poggio Marina. Do you remember that, Greg? But uh, they were concerned. It's like, you know, who's left? It's like he's brought everybody over here. So we're glad to have all of you. Psalm 19. Oh, before I do that, I did have a, uh, I, I came across uh, this summarization, these points from Ben Witherington the third. You know Ben? Prolific writer, very conservative. But here's what he said. He said it's important to bear in mind that the Psalms served four functions at once. Now he's not saying every book in the Bible does that, but he says when you approach the Psalms, they serve many functions. One, one he says, it was uh, material for singing. When, when we think in terms of Old Testament setting and the Psalms first being written, and uh, again how worship uh, was carried on, you, you, you remember in the tabernacle, when um, David moved the ark in 2 Samuel uh, 5, 6, along in there, uh, to Jerusalem, and, and there's all this rejoicing, and he lived, the, the, the Levitical singers are appointed, and, and it mentions a psalm that David wrote, more information is given in the Chronicles, I think it's 2 Chronicles 15, but more information is given there, and um, uh, there's a psalm, he puts it in the hand of Asaph, 
and so Levitical singers, and so many of the Psalms, they serve that function. It wasn't so much that the Israelites came together and had congregational singing as we do in the Lord's church today. When they approached the house of the Lord, the, first the tabernacle and then the, the temple, there would be Levitical singers that were appointed for that purpose. They were musicians, they were singers. And so you would, you would hear, instead of being a, it being reciprocal, speaking to one another uh, and everyone involved as, as we think and as we do now, scripturally, of course, under the New Testament. But not only to be sung, but also the, it was considered, and it was in fact, scripture that was read. You, you would sing, the, song, the psalms would be sung, but it's also scripture that would be read and expounded upon and taught in the temple and then all over later, you know, when the synagogue was developed during the Persian period. And a third function of the psalms is that of prayers that can be made your own, that can be recited privately or in corporate worship. And then making application, uh, further application to today. Prayer is of course one proper application, but the Psalms also are a source of teaching and preaching. I mean you see that in the New Testament. Oftentimes Psalms are referred to um, just over and over again. And then the, the point of teaching is made from them. So I thought, I thought that, was, that was a good, a good one. And um, another chart that I put together for you that uh, this, this also represents uh, Ben Witherington's arrangement is uh, to notice collections by authors within the Psalms. Now first as an author David would come to mind because out of the 150 Psalms about half of those are attributed to him approximately half. I mean it, it works out, I forget if it's 73 or some number like that, but for our purpose we'll say half of the 150. But you have Psalms from the sons of Korah. That's fascinating to me because Korah is the one that perished in, in uh, number 16. He's the Levite that rebelled, remember that? But the sons of, yeah, the earth swallowed him up. But it talks about the sons of Korah. That's a very important lesson. No matter what your family does, you get to choose. Your environment is not omnipotent. God allows us to make choices. And the sons of Korah didn't, like, didn't have to be like Korah. And that's always important to keep in mind. And then Witherington made, made a, uh, another classification, Elohistic Psalms. Of course, the Hebrew word is Elohim for God, and uh, he, he noticed that especially in chapters, in Psalms 42 through 83, in that number there, that you have uh, uh, Psalms where God is called Elohim. Of course, there are other terms by which he is called often Yahweh, but uh, uh, again, that's, that's his classification. Then the, uh, the Psalms of Asaph, again, one of the Levites, and I mentioned him earlier, and then another grouping that's interesting is the songs or the psalms of ascents. And the idea was that especially after uh, the people were scattered that they would make their way to Jerusalem. Now anytime you're going to Jerusalem, remember how the Bible speaks of that? What's the direction? Yeah, you go, you go up to Jerusalem, you're ascending. But also when you go to the temple, you're having to go up. Um, steps, portions if, that, that go back to Solomon's time on the south end of the temple in Jerusalem have been excavated. The steps that Jesus would have ascended and the, the apostles from the south side, you, you can see those. I have photos of those. So you'd still go up once you got up to Jerusalem. Then you'd literally go up to the temple area. And so the idea was that as you're traveling, uh, you don't have the uh, earphones on, you're not playing video games. Uh, you know, Kip back there, he just, he's crazy about video games. Not. But I'm, I'm just saying, you, how do you pass the time? Well, you can talk, you can look forward to what's going to happen, but um, you can also sing. And they would sing the songs of ascents as they made their journey and looking forward to being in the city of Zion, 
the city of God. So here again, just some things that maybe will be helpful with in regard to the uh, whole classification. I think that may be my last chart, it is. So let me just do that for now. So let's open, please, to, uh, to Psalm 19. We, we've said we're looking at psalms of um, thanksgiving and psalms of adoration. And I should pause at this point before we dive in. Does anyone else have a question or comment on anything we've said or a comment on the, at all of, of, about the, the psalms? Anybody? Well, in that case, let us proceed. Again, we're looking at the classification here of um, Psalms of Thanksgiving. I guess, I guess what we could do, uh, Daryl, is go back to the one you were asking about right there. And so here's where we are. Psalms of Thanksgiving and Adoration. I was thinking this morning, uh, again, getting my thoughts uh, together for our study this morning. I was thinking about a, a comment that someone, or really a question someone made after a sermon. I, I, I was preaching um, in another location, um, and it was especially emphasizing the concept that everything we have comes from God, and how thankful we should be, and I was especially looking at Romans 1, what happens when you don't give thanks to God and the, the, the great uh, uh, ungodliness and all that that happens, but emphasizing what a safeguard it is and it's only right that we should be overflowing with thanksgiving. Somebody asked a question after that lesson that I thought was a, one of those thoughtful questions shows he was thinking. He said, do you think it is possible for a truly thankful child of God to ever fall away? Now, when you put it that way, if you were just to say, is it possible for a child of God to fall away, what would you say? you say, well, yes, it's possible. But, but for a child of God who is truly thankful, it just seems that there, there are built-in safeguards. That if, if you retain that, no matter what is happening, no matter if it's tragedy, no matter if it's like with Job, you know, the, the terrible things you, that, that he went through, but you still retain that you're overflowing with thanksgiving. I guess I would say, I don't know how, I don't know how a child of God who's truly thankful could fall away. If that can happen, I just have to say, I don't know how it could happen. It just doesn't seem to me that it could happen. And that's the importance of, of what we're talking about this morning. So many passages warn about um, bitterness, anger, selfishness, envy. You see, the, the thing about all those kind of traits that are sins of the heart is that it takes you away from thoughts about the goodness of God. It takes you away from this attitude of being thank, thankful for all things. And um, to be, uh, in, in, as I, the rendering of the New American Standard, I think it's in the Colossians passage, Colossians 4, where it says, overflowing with thanksgiving. Um, that's what we want to strive for. So, uh, Stan, I'm sure as you introduced the psalm and as you covered it, you made the point that there are really two major points in this psalm. The, the thanksgiving and the, the praise of God is for, is for two things. One is the works of God, and the second is the word of God. One is the creation, the other is the revelation. So you covered the creation, didn't you? So God is praised. God is praised, verses 1 through 6, as our creator. But then, to, to just... Praise God for what His Word, the, the value of His Word, is what we have in verse 7 through 14. Stan, would you like to read those verses for me, 7 through 14, please?
Thank you. Appreciate that. So this psalm is sometimes, and, and by the way, if you, if you do much reading from good authors on the psalms, you will find one will include something in his classification that another one does not, because that's, that's a matter of judgment and going through and and some of them are more obvious than others. You know, when, when they use the word thanksgiving repeatedly, you can, you know, usually indicate that's a psalm of thanksgiving. But, for example, right here, when the psalmist is praising God for his role in creation and how awesome and wondrous that is, and then gets to the matter of the revelation, it's not like he is detached from that. It's not like he's removed from that. You can see that that he values this, that he's appreciative of that, that he's praising God for that. And so it's right, I think, to categorize this as a, as a psalm of thanksgiving. The law of the Lord is perfect. It is, it is complete. It is able to accomplish that which God intends for it to do so. And uh, it, it converts the soul. God intends by his word. Do you, do you ever hear somebody say, just be yourself, Well, I know what people mean. They mean, you know, don't be hypocritical. Don't be phony. Usually that's what they mean when they say be yourself. But on the other hand, the purpose of God's word is to change us into what God wants us to be. God doesn't say to us, just be yourself. God shows us what he wants us to become. Now, that's one thing that's wrong if, if somebody has a, well, if, whether it's a bad temper or, 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 or whatever trait, and then he goes, well, that's just the way I am. People have to accept me. That's just the way I am. Well, that, that doesn't get it. God would say, change the way you are. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. We're not to be wise in our own eyes, but where, where wisdom is to be found. Remember in the book of Job, Aaron, how that um, Job says it's not found in the mines, it's not found in the earth. They say, well, it's not here. And, and so... Uh, Here's wisdom. And even if one is simple or naive, in other words, you just have a blank slate, you don't know anything, but you come to the Word of God. And the Word of God is able to make wise the simple, because that's where wisdom is found. It's in God and it's in His Word. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. I read this passage and it occurs to me God wants us to be joyful Christians. He wants us to have joy, to be happy, for the right reasons. But where is joy to be found? Statutes of the Lord. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Well, how valuable are his, how valuable is his word, according to verse... Uh, and his statutes according to the 10th verse. More to be desired, how does that go? Than gold, yea, than much fine gold. I guess in any economy, uh, when, in any country, when you, when you consider economy, uh, the, the gold would be the, the highest standard in terms of, of what would have more value for monetary exchange. And so, more to be desired than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. And it's not that God is just telling us things we want to hear. Look at verse 11. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. God is telling us what, where to go and what to do. He's also telling us what not to do. And that's important too. When we do what God warns us not to do, we may not see the harm in it. But does that ever work out well? When we do what God says has warned us not to do, is that going to work out well for us? It never will. Warnings are there for a reason. We don't want to ignore that. Keeping them, there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. I think in terms... Of Jeremiah 17 and verse 9. Remember that passage? 
Aaron, can you quote it? Well, that's, that's Psalm 1. I'm, I'm thinking of Jeremiah 17 and verse 9 that says this. It says, I'm sorry? That's Jeremiah 10, 23. That's a good one. That's Jeremiah 10, 23. But Psalm, I, I mean Jeremiah 17, 9 is a passage that says the heart, the heart is deceptive above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. Is that right? Have you opened it up? It's Jeremiah 17, 9. Now, 20, uh, 10 and verse 23 is a good one, too, and would relate. But who can understand? If we're, if we're looking within and doing what is right in our own eyes, like in the days of Judges, who could understand his errors? All right, I'll give you another chance. Proverbs 14, 12. What, was, what does that one say? Brian, what does Proverbs 14, 12 say? Yeah. Aren't you glad? Don't you know he's glad he knows that verse? <laughs> right? There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So, who can understand his error? Cleanse me from secret faults. Now, that doesn't mean let me keep on doing the secret faults and you just forgive me anyway, but the idea is to know what is to you at this time a secret so you can quit doing it. To, to know it so that you don't continue in it. And also there's something else the Word of God does. And he's asking God to help. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. See, there's, do, you, do you see there's a contrast? Secret sin, you're kind of unaware of it. It, it's, it doesn't mean it's secret to, to other people. It means you're not aware. You need to be taught so you won't do that. But the presumptuous sin, you're aware of that. That's when you're sinning with a high hand. That's, that's like Pharaoh, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? That's when you are dismissive about what God has said and you do your own thing. So don't, I don't want to do that. Let them not have dominion over me, then I shall be blameless and be innocent of great transgression. And that closing that really is in the form of a prayer did, did you grow up as a child memorizing that verse? Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Was, did you have the experience of learning that one? That's a great one. And that's another one of those, like we were saying a while ago, in the purpose of the Psalms, that you can make that your very own as far as prayer. Okay, so that's Psalm 19. Questions or comments on that? Yes. Uh, Hank, does that kind of depend on where the system is? I mean, uh, or is that just kind of a, a blanket rule across the country? So the, the actual just reading without any right. comment or teaching is, is not forbidden. So okay, so there there are some, some and, and for that I'm thankful. But your point is well taken, and I understand that. But I was thinking that that there was still a realm in which some of that was being done. There is, but uh, the climate. That yeah. And I'm not taking away from that. That's Russell's point. Uh, to uh, add to his point, there was uh, more likely someone sitting there waiting for that to happen so that they can address it in the real litigation. Yeah, bring a lawsuit. Yeah, yeah. right. Okay. <clears throat> but the climate has really changed, and I understand what you're saying. You, you do know I'm older than you are. You, you, you always remind me of that. I'm just kidding. A little bit. Okay, well, yeah. Good point. Now, what does that tell us? We, we live in the world. So, we don't depend on the school system 
to teach the Word of God, right? What that means is the church is to do its part, and the home is to do its part. And, and really, the home first, when you think in terms of what's primary, and the church, of course, constantly teaching. Good point. Thank you for that. Anything else? Fellowship. Yes. Yeah. When verse 7 says that the whole, the whole point of well, Scripture is yeah. to teach it. To well, Hank didn't say it was consistent. <laughs> yeah. That, uh, well, that's true. And, and, and you know, we, we try to make that observation in the passing that that's the point of God never looks at, the, um, at His Word as being something you just read for intellectual stimulation. <laughs> it's always, this is to change you. This is to be translated in into action and into attitudes, but it is to change us. But, you know, you can see the point that there's a difference in just reading the text and then putting your slant on it, putting your, so there are reasons behind that. Did you have a hand up here, brother? Yeah, the, when, you, when you read this psalm, what strikes me is our very existence depends on God. In our very life and how we live our life and what, in the right way, Very good. Brian? Is it interesting that in the psalm David doesn't actually begin talking to God until he's 11? You know, it's like more of a Bible than more servant. Before that, he hasn't actually said anything directly to God in the psalm. And you will actually see that in a lot of the psalms where some attribute of God is praised or something is, is mentioned, and then you shift from a discussion of the subject to the direct address to God. Right. And it's interesting what he says before that. Because in Psalm 1 3, it says, you know, blessed is the man who has patience in the law of the Lord, and then God meditates day and night. Yes. You know, when you get into Hank and you read the Psalm, you can't be in the Spirit without having applied the Word and meditated on the Word and mused on the Word. It's interesting that he recognizes it as a transforming power. Mm hmm. Good observations. Um, when we started our Sunday evening series here the first of the year, some of you here at Hansville may remember. Y'all do remember all the sermons I preached, don't you? <coughs> Steve's going. Um, but anyway, on the Psalms, I selected Psalm 1. And the point I made, one of the points I made about Psalm 1 relates to what Bryant just said there, and that is that... Um, in many ways, Psalm 1 serves as the introduction for all the Psalms. And, and you, you can see how it would have a bearing on the Psalm we're currently studying here. Okay, let's, let's look at chapter 29 because that's our next one. And um, see if we can, this one has 11 verses. And you could say, I think, Stan, you could say that the subject matter, not the exact wording at all, but the subject matter here is similar to Psalm 19, the first six verses of Psalm 19, where God is praised for his role in creation. And that's more of what you have here. The... Um, it, it's so interesting to me that, that here you're praising God for his role in creation, but the, the wording in verse 2, um, 
and, and, and as it re well, one and two, as it relates to uh, what follows here in verse three and four. In verse three, what, what, what I'm looking at here is what's so fascinating right here. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. And then you remember when talking about uh, Hebrew poetry that the rhyming is in thought. Remember that? It's going to be a, stating it in a different way or emphasizing by way of contrast. So it's going to be a parallel statement or an antithetical statement. So here the voice of the Lord is over the waters. And then what does the next phrase say? Anybody? The God of glory thunders. Thunders. And... Um, the voice of the Lord is powerful. And here it's, uh, the idea is that God is in the storm. The God of glory, His voice booms, it thunders. And that's one aspect of His, of his control of creation. But anyway, let's, uh, let's read this psalm together, Psalm 29. Jonathan, what translation are you using there? ESV. You don't have the King James with you, do you? Um, from your seat there, read for me good and loud this psalm. It's, it's just 11 verses. Would you read it for me, please? This is from the English Standard Version. Well done. So it seems that God is being adored. He is being praised. We're including this in the Thanksgiving Psalms. Again for His role in creation. His, his not, not only His role in creation, but His role in sustaining the creation. Are both of those topics in the New Testament that, that through the Son, Jesus created all things, but He also upholds all things by His power? Colossians 1 will say, in Him all things, Russell, consist. And the word consist there means to, yeah, it's the, to adhere, to hold together. <coughs> So it's not like God just created everything and then lets it spin, stands back. He continues, the, you can say, well, you know, you got all these laws in operation, the law of gravity and the centripetal force and uh, magnetism and all the things that keep things going like that. Well, yeah, but where, there's, uh, where there is a law, there must be a law giver. And it's true that he governs by laws, but it's laws that he has originated and that he has put in motion. And so uh, it's right to praise God not only for creation, but sustaining his creation. By the way, did you notice, uh, let me see here. I have, I, I really like in the Psalms to consult the the, uh, the King James as well, but th there's no difference in that in the New King James here. It says, give to the Lord, O ye mighty. And uh, uh, 
did you notice when Jonathan was reading that, did, let, read that again, did you not say heavenly ones or heavenly beings? How does it say that? Heavenly, heavenly beings. This probably, uh, that's probably a very good translation on that in the sense that it's not just calling mighty people in the earth, you know, human beings, but the, the mighty ones here would even include the heavenly beings, in other words, the angelic host. Angels are created beings. Psalm 148 teaches that, verse 2, <coughs> verse 2 and 5. And in Psalm 148, uh, angels are among the various aspects of creation that are called upon to praise God. So probably here, the concept of the mighty one is, is his angelic force, the, 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 the angelic host, I mean to say there. But of course, you know, you could argue from the greater to the lesser. That is to say, we know that nobody's left out. Everyone is included. Give to the Lord glory and strength. I want to ask you, how can, how can we give unto the Lord glory and strength? Since He is the source of that. There you go. It, it's when we give Him credit for that. We ascribe unto Him the glory that is due His name. It, we can't make Him greater than He is, but we can recognize His greatness. He's not made lesser if we don't praise Him, but we are the less for it. We're the losers if we don't. Josh? Kind of reminds me of uh, somebody asked. You know, sometimes there's a, uh, there's a discussion when we say, uh, "Is it right to?" Uh, you know, when we say, "Bless this food." When you say, "Well, if, if God is the one that gives the blessing, how, how can we be the ones who bless this food?" Well, it's simply recognizing where it comes from. We're, we're blessing God as we praise Him for what He has bestowed upon us, and, and that's the thing here. We're not giving Him more glory and strength than is already has, but we are ascribing that to Him, recognizing that. Give unto the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the Lord and the beauty of holiness. The NIV on that says, in the splendor of His holiness. And so when we have that mindset, when we, when we see that, that what really has beauty and desirability, what is really attractive, the holiness of the Lord, but, but as I say, that, so that, that introduces it. But it's, it seems that where he's going with that is to look specifically at, at when there's a storm. The voice of God, the glory of God in thunder. I mean, that's the, that's the wording in verse 3. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The glory of God thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. Now, you could say, well, yeah, but it, it, the voice of the Lord, it might not be talking about a storm or lightning and thunder. It might just be saying, you know, His voice is powerful like the roar of many waters, and which kind of reminds me of the wording of Jesus, you know, in His glory in Revelation 1. But every passage, Brady, every passage has a, every passage has a context. Hope you all don't get tired of hearing me say that. Because if you're wondering, well, what does that mean? Well, keep reading. And so when it talks about the voice of God breaks the cedars, the, the Lord splinters the cedars of Lebanon, is there anything that comes to your mind that would do that? Yeah, lightning bolts. Lightning. There's thunder. Of course, where there's thunder, there's lightning. You, you do know that, don't you? <laughs> and so, so here's the sound. Here, here's the effect of, of the, the lightning. And let me ask you this, why would, if he's talking about, I mean, since he's talking about that, why would he specify the cedars of Lebanon? Why not just say a grove of pine trees that's going to be made into, uh, into paper, you know, pulp, pulpwood? Why would he say cedars of Lebanon? Yeah. Here, here if, if, 
this is the epitome of, of the greatest of trees, the cedars of Lebanon, powerful, towering. You, you remember when Solomon wanted to build the temple where, where the cedar, where the wood came from? It was the cedars of Lebanon. Here, here are the finest, here, here's the greatest, but God is greater. And so the idea is the, the, the lightning here that, uh, that, that would come, splinter them, make, and, and, and the movement making them skip like a calf, Lebanon and Syrian like a young wild ox. The Syrian, by the way, can I give you a reference on that? Um, over in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 3, when Moses is talking about the conquest of the eastern side there, um, he says, the two kings of the Amorites, that's Sihon and Og, this is verse 8, who were on this side of the Jordan from the river Arnon to Mount Hermon. But then he says in verse 9, the Sidonians call Hermon Syrian, and the Amorites call it Sinir. So that lets you know what this is talking about. This is, we usually would refer to it at Mount Hermon, but right, see right at the foothills of Mount Hermon, you've got water flowing. By the way, the mountain is called Sinir, and you will see in that part of Israel the Sinir River. That's one of the tributaries that forms the Jordan. So, so here you have up in the north, the Cedars of Lebanon, you have that region of Mount Hermon, the, the greatest mountain, the greatest trees, and God is over all. His glory, even seen in the, in the storm here. Uh, and, and verse 7, the Lord divides the flames of fire. Again, that would make sense if it's speaking of lightning. Shaking the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. If you remember Kadesh Barnea, this is talking about the wilderness to the south, the desert area, south of Israel, south and uh, west. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth strips the forest bare. And in his temple, everyone says, glory. And what about the great flood? The Lord sat enthroned at the flood. The Lord sits as king forever. But he's not just powerful. He is powerful to rule favorably on behalf of his people. Verse 11, the Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Well, what we're going to do now is I want to pass out questions for next week. We obviously won't have time this morning to do these, uh, this sheet you have, page three. But uh, I have the next sheet, which what this will do, it will show you the Psalms we're going to look at next, uh, the Thanksgiving Psalms. So if I could have a couple of guys helping me and pass uh, these out to all four sections, uh, I would appreciate that.
classes. We're glad that our visitors are here, and uh, we're glad that you took time to uh, be with us this morning. We have many visitors, and we want to welcome you and invite you back anytime. It's uh, convenient for you to be with us. Um, speaking of, we have visitors cards that are located in the back of the pews. If you'd fill one of those out and place it in the collection plate as it comes around this morning or hand it to one of the visitors, uh, one, of, one of us, <laughs> not one of the visitors, <laughs> but uh, hand it to one of us uh, on, the, on your way out this morning. We'll uh, take time at the uh, end of the service this morning to make further announcements. We gather here this morning to worship God. We pray, or it is our prayer, that we do that in spirit and in truth and do it in a manner that pleases Him and Him alone. As we began this morning, let's begin by reading scripture from the letter of Philippians. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, so God shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let's take time to gather our thoughts, a moment of silence. And then we'll go to our Father in prayer.
And also our hearts are directed in 2 Corinthians 9, 7 is how we should give. Let us pray for this collection. Father God in heaven, we thank you for every blessing. We thank you for this time we have this morning to give back a portion of what we've earned back to thee. That the work, Father, will continue on. We pray, Father, that this money will be used in ways that please you. We pray, Father, that you always be, uh, always strengthen our elders here, Father, that watch over us, continue to bless them and their families. In Jesus' name we do pray.
I'd like to direct our minds, if you will, for just a moment before we pray and we partake. In John chapter 19, John chapter 19, starting verse 1. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and placed it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe, and they said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him with their hands. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out wearing a crown of thorns and a purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold, the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was more afraid, and he went again into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and power to release you? And Jesus said, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has a greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you're not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard the saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement. But in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold, your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. <clears throat> then he delivered them, <clears throat> delivered him to be crucified. Then they took Jesus and led him away. And he bearing the cross went out to a place called of the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side, with Jesus in the center. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Let us pray. Father God in heaven, we are so thankful of your love for us, abundance of blessings that you give us. Help us always, Father, to be mindful of that great love, the great sacrifice, Father, that was given in our place. Father, we pray that as we partake of this bread, that we would do so in a manner pleasing and acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.
Gracious Heavenly Father, as we continue our thanks for this fruit of the vine, this cup which represents Christ's blood which was willingly shed upon the cross for our sins, we ask that you be with each individual that is about to partake, help them to rid all worldly things from their mind and focus upon the sacrifice that's been set before us. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you're using your song books this morning, I'll encourage you to go ahead and mark, as indicated on the board, number 271, 271. We'll be using that at the conclusion of the lesson this morning. And as indicated on the overhead, number 142, more love to the oak.
I love thy kingdom more. If it's comfortable and convenient for you, I encourage you to join me in standing as we sing this song. Revelation 1 and verse 10, the Apostle John said, while he was exiled on the island of Patmos for the testimony of our Lord, John wrote and said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. The Lord's day is a special day. Jesus was raised on the first day of the week. By his resurrection, he was declared in Romans 1 and verse 4 to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness. It was on the first day of the week that he met with the disciples. That day he was raised and the following week as well, it specifies in John on the first day of the week, he met with them. He made many appearances over 40 days. Then he ascended. 50 days after Pentecost, 50 days after Passover, I mean, came the Feast of Pentecost. And that day of Pentecost was always after the seven weeks and the seventh Sabbath. It was the next day, which is the first day of the week. And as we saw this morning in Acts 20 and verse 7, as Kip used that as the first of his scripture references, the disciples came together on the first day of the week to break bread. I am persuaded that that's exactly what John was talking about the day he was speaking of when he said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. 
And this morning, as we're th earlier thinking about the Psalms and Psalms of Thanksgiving, how thankful we should be for each Lord's Day and the opportunity to gather around the Lord's table and uh, partake of the bread and fruit of the vine in memory of his body and blood that was sacrificed for us. We have so much to be thankful for. I, I mentioned as Linda and I were having breakfast earlier this morning, to have clarity of mind and good health. I appreciate that more as I get older. And just the opportunity for us to come together and have so many visitors and sing together these good songs and worship together, it is something for which I'm thankful. And I don't want to take that for granted. It's good to see all of you this morning. Our text of scripture will be taken from Ephesians chapter 6. I'm sorry, I meant to say Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to be looking at this passage of scripture beginning in verse 15. And I want to read from verse 15 through 33, and we'll go back and notice some things here in this, in this text, Ephesians chapter 5. Russell was mentioning Wednesday night his joy at hearing so many pages turn when we give scriptural references and I join him with that. Of course some of you are clicking and that's okay as long as you're looking at references but I, I do like to hear those pages turning. Ephesians 5 verse 15 Therefore be careful how you walk not as unwise men but as wise making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not become, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Now verse 22 begins a new paragraph and a new thought. Verse 22 says, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. Verse 24, but as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their own, to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that she should be holy and blameless. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own, his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each individual among you also love his own wife even as himself, and let the wife see to it that she respect her husband. That, by the way, was the reading from the New American Standard translation of Ephesians 5, 15 through 33. We have seen in our recent gospel meeting last uh, month at the end of April, third week of April, we saw in the first three chapters of Ephesians as, as Seth took us through using just verse by verse calling attention to the, the text, we saw in those first three chapters the, the great thoughts of God, words such as his eternal purpose in chapter 3 and verse 10 are mentioned. Words such as predestination, foreordination, the planning of God for our redemption through Jesus Christ before the world ever existed. 
And so what he has purposed, what he has done, his great love for us, and Paul expressing his prayers for us that we might know the love of God that passes knowledge. And again, one, two, and three great chapters, profound, deep thoughts that you can just continue to explore that and think about that. As Steve often says, try to get your mind around it. And then having done that, starting in chapter 4, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. He says to, as a prisoner of the Lord, he says, I beseech you to have a walk worthy of the calling wherewith you are called. And so it's, it's the walk, it's the day-to-day -day living based upon these principles that have been enunciated in chapters 1, 2, and 3. And we need both. We need to try to think the, the deep thoughts of God that have been revealed. And we'll never exhaust the treasure that we have there, but we need to try. We need to keep probing and seeing and marveling at God and the things that He has done for us. But we need also to see that what this is all about is He's called us to be His people. And so here is how we are to live. And so we don't make some kind of a disconnect between our, our study about God and the, 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 the things of God that are set forth in profound principles. We don't make a disconnect between that and how we live from day to day. This is so practical when you look at chapter 4 and 5 and 6. And so we want to look at, at that. And I'm aware if, if there are those present, and there are those present who have not yet become children of God, don't overlook the fact that, that what is urgent is that you need to obey the gospel. And it's a wonderful thing that you have that opportunity even this morning. But once you have been cleansed by the blood of Christ, God has a plan for us. And that's what this is talking about. It's how His people are to live. We said in our class this morning, God's intent is to, to change us. It is to shape us. Luke 6 and verse 40, a servant, I, I mean a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. And so that's what this is about. What we, what we admire, what we look to with awe, what we, what we reverence, what we revere, we resemble. And to have the qualities that are in these chapters is nothing else except to have the qualities of Christ. Or as Ephesians 5 begins by saying, to be imitators of God and walk as beloved children. The text says in verse 5, See that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. You know, you, you, you think about danger that is present, and it makes you walk circumspectly. You know, this time of year when wasps are building their nest and, and uh, sometimes just seem to be flying everywhere, you might want to be careful where you put your hands. You might want to kind of look around and, and watch out about that. And I hate to bring this up because Linda doesn't like to think about it, but if you've ever had the misfortune of, a, of an unwanted reptile fastening its fangs on the back of your leg, you tend to walk circumspectly. I'm not going to demonstrate how she walks, but when she's in the yard, I will tell you she is, as, they, as the saying goes, she is aware of her surroundings. If you've slipped, if you've had a fall, like Larry or myself, um, if concrete is wet, you, you don't, if, if you're wise, you don't just kind of, you know, here, here we go and pay no attention to stuff like that. You kind of look down and you, you want to not stumble over things. You don't want to slip and fall. Of course, if, you got, if you're like me, you've got a lot of people, Daddy, this is wet now, watch out. And I think, how old do you think I am here? But you walk circumspectly. And so that's, that's taken from when you're aware of, of potential danger, you're careful where you put your feet, where you walk. And the, the point, of course, is spiritual. We live in a world... We live in a world that is not safe 
There are all kinds of snares. In 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 11, that no advantage be gained over us by Satan, for we're not ignorant of his devices. 1 Peter 5 and verse 8, be sober, be vigilant. Our adversary, the devil, walks about as a roaring lion seeking who may, who may, may devour. So to be vigilant, walk circumspectly, is to be aware of, of the snares and pitfalls. Satan is our enemy, and he is doing his very best to defeat us, to take us away from, from our Lord, to distract us. And if it's not something that's intrinsically wrong, Satan will still, even as our brother Keith led us in prayer this morning, did you notice that about being thankful for our blessings, but help us that these not cause us to sin? Blessings can be used by Satan to cause us to be materialistic, covetous, or just plain distracted. You know, just, just distracted. Like good people like Martha could be in Luke chapter 10. You're anxious and troubled, Jesus said, about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Don't go away reading that passage and think, well, Martha just wasn't a spiritual person. You know, she didn't. What do you think she was doing? She's preparing a meal for the Lord. She loved the Lord. She's a good woman. She's a godly woman. But good and godly people can be distracted. And at that time she was, and Jesus was her friend to point that out to her. We need to walk circumspectly. So many things can distract us from what is the one thing that is needful. So we need to walk circumspectly. And he goes on to say, not as fools, but as wise. You know, the Bible doesn't go around calling people names, and we're not to just call people names in derision and be derogatory, and the Bible condemns that. But sometimes the word is used not like that, but uh, as a descriptive term. The one that is the fool here is the one that is not wise. He's the one that's not coming to God for wisdom and instruction. And really, wisdom does not permit us to drift aimlessly through life. We are to live with purpose, which is the transition into the next verse. When we look at verse 16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Time is precious. Sometimes people talk about wasting time. You, you, you're familiar with that expression. Well, if, if you waste time, what are, what are you really wasting? If you're wasting time, you're wasting life. Because that's what life is made of, isn't it? Our life here, is, isn't that the, the time that God gives us, the, the days of our lives? That's time. If we're wasting time, we're wasting life. And what is wasted can never be recaptured. I mean, you can repent of that. You can determine from this point on to do better. But when we waste time, we're wasting life. And it can never be regained. Redeeming the time. The text says because the days are evil. That does not contradict passages that say that, that would say he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. The Bible talks about good days and our, it's right to desire good days. And yet here Paul says the days are evil. What does that mean? That's recognizing that we live in a broken world. We live in a world that has been broken by sin. I don't know how it is all over the country, but here in the South, this time of year, florists are kept very busy. Decoration days come around. And so you go to the grave, and you put flowers there, you, you visit. I, I, know, I know that that's fast becoming not as a big thing as it has been in the past. You know, the decorations and the gatherings and family get-togethers. But as you go to the cemetery, you look at some tombstones, and you see some died quite young. 
And it may be a place where you're familiar. That was a schoolmate of yours, or that's somebody you knew. Besides your family, and besides those that are older than you, some of us put flowers on the graves of our children or grandchildren. We live in a broken world. We're not in heaven yet. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. In this life there's death. In this life there is tribulation. In this life there is persecution. In this life there is sorrow. And what Paul is saying is that's all the more reason that you make it count that you are wise that you do what you should, redeeming the time because the days are evil. And then, I said this was practical, verse 17 says, therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. How, how would you understand that? Don't be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. But see, it's an unwise thing for you to try to walk by your own wisdom. Uh, someone mentioned this morning, Jeremiah 10, verse 23. O oh Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his own steps. We reference Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Don't be foolish. It's not in your heart. It's not within you to direct your own steps. Nor is it to just kind of look at the spirit of the world and see what's going on around about you and so go by, the, by other people or by the majority. Don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. I believe that's the contrast there, that, that it's foolish to look at any other guidance to understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, that would take us back to Ephesians chapter 3 where Paul explained beginning in verse 3 how that by revelation he made known unto the, me the mystery that, as I wrote before in a few words, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And so understand what the will of the Lord is. These things he says I've written to you. When you read you can understand. And so that's, that's how we can know the will of the Lord. We could never know it instinctively. We could never know it by use of our empirical senses or exploration or figuring it out some other way. It's what eye has not seen and ear has not heard. It's never entered into the heart of man. God had to reveal these things through His Spirit. The Spirit searched the mind of God and then revealed these to inspired men who wrote them down. Don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. We should be so thankful for the apostles, for the prophets that are referenced in, in Ephesians 3 and verse 5. Because we are heirs to their work. It is because of God's usage of them, though they were earthen vessels, in them the treasures of the gospel were deposited. When we read, we can understand. Be not foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And then he says, well, this, is, this is also, you see, you see how Paul is using contrast. Don't do this, but do this. Don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Um, walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. So we learn by contrast a lot of times that don't do this, but it's this that God wants. And here you have it coming up in verse 18 and 19. Don't be drunk, drunk do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Verse 19, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So two, two kinds of conduct are here contrasted. Do you ever, um, you're familiar with what it is, what it means when somebody is arrested. Of course, often th things like that end up, uh, depending on who it is, it might be in the paper, it might be on the news, and DUI. Driving, he's, he's under the influence. And so here's the contrast. Whose influence are we under? If, if one is drunk with wine, he is, 
we, we call that kind of person driving under the influence, or he's acting under the influence. So he's intoxicated. And so don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And so the idea is under the full sway, under the full influence of the Spirit of God. Not under the influence of alcohol, not abusing alcohol, not abusing drugs and acting out what those things will cause you to do. But as you're filled with the Spirit, well, how do you act then? The next verse says, speaking one to another. See, Spirit-filled people sing spiritual songs. I so much enjoyed the songs that were selected and sung together this morning. That's what Spirit-filled people do. They sing spiritual songs. Now, the Holy Spirit of God, there, there is much that He has done and continues to do. When we think in terms of the miraculous manifestations of the Spirit, we would say the apostles were given the ability to do the miraculous. And then we need to see what Simon saw in Acts 8 and verse 18. The text there says that Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given. And so the Bible speaks of those that would, would uh, prophesy. The Bible speaks of those that would speak in tongues because they had miraculous gifts of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 are three consecutive chapters that talk about the gifts of the Spirit as the Spirit distributes to each one as He wills. Again, the apostles, those upon whom the apostles laid hands, miraculous manifestations of the Spirit, but I submit to you that that is not what Paul is talking about right here when he says be filled with the Spirit. Context. What he goes on to say is not miraculous. What he goes on to say is speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And that's part of the same sentence that's tied together. You're filled with the Spirit. You're under the influence of the Spirit of God. Not under the influence of drugs. Not under the influence of alcohol. Under the influence of the Spirit of God. And of course... The way the Spirit influences us is by having revealed the mind of God. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians 6 and verse 17. And so we don't want to be under the influence of the drugs, the intoxicants that's so prevalent and so destructive in our society today. There are people that have businesses that are looking for people to work and they can't find workers to find the positions because they can't even pass the drug test. Can't even get started. And I don't know how many drivers we're meeting on the road as we're going about. They're under the influence of some kind of intoxicant or drug. So he says, don't do that. Be imitators of God. Walk his beloved children. This is, and by the way, he says, don't be drunk with wine wherein is dissipation. Now that, that's, that word there is the same word that's found over uh, when Jesus was telling about the prodigal son in, um, that, that, as we often call it. There are really two sons that are under consideration. But, but that's another story. But anyway, in, as, as he looks at that in Luke chapter 15, he talked about the younger son that went from the father's house and it says, and he wasted his substance with riotous living. Your translation may say with with prodigal living. That's the same word there that describes the, the man that we call the prodigal son, as is used here, translated dissipation. What does that mean? Well, it's, it's wasteful. That, that son wasted his father's substance with, with prodigal living. It's destructive. It's wasteful. So not to belabor the point, but he says, don't, don't do that. Don't be filled with wine. That's destructive. It's wasteful, but be filled with the Spirit. And so sing the spiritual songs. And notice, notice how that you have a twofold direction here that is both vertical and horizontal in verse 19. Speaking to one another. That's reciprocal as we, uh, that's what I'm calling horizontal. We're, we're encouraging each other. We're singing and speaking one to another. But notice he says, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. That's what I mean by vertical. It's from our heart and it's directed to the Lord, but we're also at the same time encouraging one another. And that's the wisdom of God. He's the one that, that knew that we benefit, we're edified, and He is glorified as we do that. 
Singing is not something that, you know, leads into worship. It, le- it introduces into the sermon or something like that. Singing is worship. And it's a very important aspect of our worship unto God. But so also is praying. In verse 20, the sentence continues. Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I think I see five things in that one passage of Scripture. First, there's the what, giving thanks. And then there's when, always. And then there's for what, for all things. And then to whom, to God the Father. And then there's through whom, and that is in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? You have all that in one verse. What? When? For what? To whom? And through whom? But then in verse 21, we have one of those... I I just said we're seeing in singing something that is vertical, something that's horizontal. And here we've just seen in verse 20, again, what is directed to God and through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's vertical. But then there's that one of those one another passages in verse 21, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Submitting to one another. In the past, we've done lessons, series of lessons, um, on the one another passages in Scripture. There's so many of them. To love one another. To edify one another. To receive one another. To bear one another's burdens. Uh, There's so many passages like that, and and this is in that category of those passages that speak of one another relationships, submitting to one another in the fear of God. If we are submitting to one another, what I see is that we see each other as brethren. Nobody uh, nobody is feeling he's superior to others. There's mutual submission. So I I see humility there, but I also see accountability that we're making ourselves accountable. And, and that we have the attitude, if, if you see something amiss, talk to me. A, a willingness to help and a willingness to be helped. I mean, some might be real good at giving advice, but they're not too good at taking it. But submitting to one another. They're, they're, what this is going to do, and see, Paul knows what happens when you don't have this. Because before Ephesians was written, 1 Corinthians was written. And he knows what happened when this spirit, what happens when this spirit is not here. And he says, I hear in chapter 1, there are divisions among you. And one is saying, I'm of Paul, and I'm of Apollos, and I'm of Cephas, and I'm of Christ. Is Christ divided? And so in those first three chapters in particular, there's this divisive spirit that's existing where they're not submitting one to another. Well, and, and, and you look at, at how they were doing about the spiritual gifts, the idea of if you can speak in tongues, you know, that's the most desirable thing. And, and here, let me just speak in tongues. And Paul has to regulate that. God's not the author of confusion, but of peace. Let all things be done decently and in order. And a lot of things are said along that line because they were not submitting one to another. And so in the absence of this passage, you have division, you have discord. But... With this kind of attitude, we can have harmony. We can have peace. It's it's a desirable thing for brethren to dwell together in unity and for there to be peace among us and for Satan not to have his way and, and for there to be discord and strife and division, but for us to have that harmony and peace, we have to pay attention to passages like this that say submitting to one another in the fear of God. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, what comes up next. Those are important practical principles, aren't they? But then we have wives and husbands that are under consideration. And so I want to sum up what follows. The wife is told to submit to her husband as unto the Lord. And it is of God, that that be the case. In verse 23, 
The husband is head of the wife, as Christ is head of the church. And as he is the Savior of the body, therefore just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And so we learn to study passages in their context, and we also learn to study them in relation to passages that have a bearing on the same theme or topic. For example, in Acts chapter 5 and verse 29, do you remember that when Peter was threatened, the apostles were threatened, I should say, and uh, that uh, you don't teach anymore in his name. You can't do that. You remember the answer in Acts 5 and verse 29, we must obey God rather than men. And so you'd have that principle here, obviously, when it says obey your husbands in everything, that would be the exception. We must obey God rather than man. But otherwise, the idea of it is respecting the headship and authority of the husband as God has ordained. The husbands are addressed in verse 25. Love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, you know, that's kind of like when Jesus said in John 13, verse 34 and 35, that we are to love one another. He says, as I have loved you. If he had just said love one another, you would not think we can handle that. But he sure raised the bar when he said, as I have loved you. That's what made it what he called there a new commandment that I give unto you. And it's the same thing here. He doesn't just tell the husband to love the wife. If, if, if that were it, you could say, well, I can handle that. But he says, as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that is the church, that he might sanctify and cleanse it by the washing of water with the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So these verses tell us about Christ's love for the church, that Christ gave himself for the church. He wanted to sanctify and cleanse the church with the washing of water by the word. Of course, those are summary statements. You've got concepts of sanctification, cleansing, the washing of water with the word. We're not cleansed as a collectivity. We're cleansed by the blood of Christ individually as we obey the gospel of Christ. As each one is born again, as John 3, verses 3 through 5, as we are born of water and the Spirit, we are cleansed by the blood of Christ at the point we are scripturally baptized into Christ. And the Lord adds the saved to his church. And so what the result is, is we're identified with the church of our Lord. But he doesn't just say cleanse, he also says sanctify. Now cleansing takes place at that point in time when you obey the gospel. You're cleansed from every past sin. But we continue to need the cleansing blood of Christ, 1 John 1, 7. And also that word sanctification means to be set apart, which happens as we obey the gospel, but it also is a process, and we need to see it that way, that it is an ongoing process to continue to be sanctified, to, to be set apart for the Lord's service. So it has a beginning, but the concept of being cleansed, the concept of being sanctified must be an ongoing process. So that's what he wants. And ultimately in verse 27, he will present to himself a glorious church. That's talking about when Jesus comes again, receiving the saved unto himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it, that it should be holy and without blemish. So here you have it. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. But he doesn't just go on to something else. He deals with that. He modifies that part, explains what he means when he says, as Christ loved the church. That's your pattern. That's our pattern as husbands. Because verse 28, that's the very application he makes. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own body. See, the church is the body of Christ. He loves the church. And the husband is to love his wife as his own body, just like Christ loves his body, which is the church. Then he says, he who loves his wife loves himself. Isn't that interesting, the wisdom of God, that here you are, it's like, well, okay, you know, and it's like, I'll do all this for her. But the one who benefits when he has this unselfish, 
Christ-like love is not just the wife, but it's the husband. He loves himself. He's doing what's in his own best interest when he is unselfish and sets aside his self-interest for his companion. It was lost on me for some time. Well, it's just one of those things I hadn't come across in my research and study. I would be reading about these husbandmen in the parables of Jesus in the, in the gospel accounts. And most more current versions will use the word vine dressers. But the older English uses this word husbandman. I mean, I don't hear anybody today talking about husbandman. Even, even where people have their grapevines, they don't talk about husbandman. But that's actually a, a good word, and it was a word that was, that was used to describe the vine dresser. Husbandman. And the idea was, he's called that because he is taking care of the vineyard. He takes care of the vines. He, he looks and, and, and he, he, he trims what needs to be trimmed. He's fertilizing. But he's taking care of the vineyard. And so he's a husbandman. But, but see, what, what is the basic meaning of that word husband is not just the male that is married. You know, it has a meaning. And, and as, you, as you look at, at the word origin, it's the idea of, of someone who is a caretaker. And just as the husbandman would take care of the vineyard. Isn't that a beautiful thought? The husband takes care of his wife. And that's a primary concern. It's not like, yeah, we'll do that too. It's not secondary to his role. And so that's the very meaning of the word. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the body. So the, what his application is that as husbands we nourish and cherish our wives. Many of you here knew and know Bob Waldron. Some of you knew him very well. Sandra died, his wife died in September 2011. And since then, uh, as before then, Bob and I have kept in close communication and he's mentioned several times that one of the things he misses so much is not having someone to cherish in the sense of cherishing your wife, of course. And he said, when I have opportunity to speak to men today, he said, I tell them to cherish your husbands. That's good advice. You won't ever regret that. But time that is wasted in strife and discord in the home and setting aside these biblical principles that are to govern the home, that time can never be recaptured. And it violates what this text is saying. We are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. And so he, he uses the analogy for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, the two, the two shall become one flesh. Well, what does that mean? Now you might say, well, there's the sexual union that's authorized in marriage. And it's not wrong for that to come to mind because that certainly is true and is dealt with in the scripture. But it means so much more than that. Here are two people Two entirely separate individuals, and they're becoming one. Two become one. But then he says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. And that is, the, the mystery is how we become one with Christ, as we're identified with him and his spiritual body, oneness with him. And so you see, that is the pattern that we have, the goal, the lofty concept that we as husbands are to have. And he goes on to say, nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband or she reverences her husband, depending on your translation. This concept of love and respect, so vital. And when that's violated, there's havoc, there's chaos, there's destruction, 
and everybody suffers. I'm reminded of Paul Earnhardt, the gospel preacher that we, I think, all love and admire. He's well on in his 80s now. But I heard him say not too very long ago, he said, I'm still trying to learn how to be a good husband. Can you identify with that? Because when you look at what these verses say, it's not like, well, you know, don't need to grow anymore, don't need to develop. It's But to have here what God speaks of, to have this kind of relationship with a husband and his wife. I said we live in a broken world. We live in a sin-cursed world. There's death and decay here. But to have that now is to have a taste of heaven. It's from God. He is the author of that. And this is what God desires for us. And so what Paul is doing is he's giving the guidelines so that we can have this kind of marriage, this kind of home, this kind of relationship with brethren, this kind of, and all, of course, growing out of our relationship with God. So what we have is a book that's reaching into the past, into eternity, the purpose of God. Here's a, a, a couple of paragraphs in a chapter that talks about Jesus' death for our sins, the, his great redemptive work. But it also looks ahead to the time that we become the inheritance of God that is received by our Lord at his coming, the glorious church presented unto himself. I'll tell you, it's a passage that gives me hope and joy. And I want to appeal to those of you that have not yet obeyed the gospel. Do you not want what this passage is talking about? The relationship with God, the submission to him, the joy, the hope that is here in this text. And the wonderful thing is, if you want this, you can have it. God wants you to have it. He's extending this to you. He's in inviting you to come as together we stand and sing.
Again, we're glad that you're here, and especially if you're visiting with us. We do have many visitors. We want to invite you back anytime you can be with us, and we are prayerful for uh, your continued safety and travels. Uh, just a few announcements uh, aside from those in our newsletter. If you have not picked up one, we encourage you to do so on your way out in the vestibule. John and Tom Baggett are at home and this morning. They are both not feeling well. And then um, Thomas Poe is not here because he's leading singing this morning in the Springville Gospel Meeting. Uh, they are having uh, young men in the area to uh, participate in all parts of that meeting, that time that they are together. Um, also, I wanted to mention that Jonathan Graves and his family will be in the Huntsville area this evening. Again, we have gathered here to worship God, and we pray that we have done that uh, in a way that uh, he wills us to. If we have done something that uh, you find is not uh, in, in his will or his word, uh, you'd be our friend to talk to us about that. I have one announcement following the prayer. Um, I'll ask you to remain uh, as you are after the prayer. Before we go to God in prayer, I'll be reading from uh, the second letter to the Thessalonians in chapter 2. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. Let us go to God in prayer. 